This is a short video on placental abruption. I'll be talking about the etiology, the pathophysiology, and the manifestations of placental abruption. As in all of these flowcharts, each of the boxes is color-coded according to this legend in the top right. And I'll be clearing all the boxes and repopulating the flowchart as we talk about each concept. Let's go ahead and get started with the definition of placental abruption. Placental abruption is when you have partial or complete separation of the placenta from the uterus prior to delivery of the baby. Now, of course, <clears throat> it's normal to have separation of the placenta once baby is delivered. Sometimes it's called the fourth stage of pregnancy, the delivery of the placenta. But when you have it before delivery, that's abnormal and it's quite dangerous. It can cause a lot of bleeding and a lot of distress for the mom and the fetus. So that a partial or complete separation of the placenta, as I mentioned, will cause bleeding from the fetal and maternal vessels, and it can cause a disruption of oxygen and nutrients to the fetus. Now, how does this happen? It all comes back to these two concepts early in the pathophysiology. There are vascular changes in the placenta formation and or there has been some severe, abrupt, quick stretching of the uterus. <clears throat> In short, one or two of these factors come together and the vascular networks that connect to the uterine lining and the maternal side of the placenta are torn. And that's what causes the placental abruption. Now, another way to think of this is that the uterus and the placenta have different consistencies. The uterus is a muscle, so it's elastic. It can stretch pretty quickly and pretty easily. It's more squishy. The placenta remains stable. It's less stretchy and it's less squishy. So when you have these two things right up against each other, one of them is elastic, able to move and stretch. The other one is less elastic, wants to stay stable. They're more likely to tear. They're more likely to peel apart from each other when they're undergoing some kind of trauma, when they're kind of pushed very abruptly or accelerated or decelerated very abruptly. So remember that the uterus as a muscle can move, can bend, can stretch. The placenta has a harder time doing that. So when you move them together as a unit very quickly, one of them will deform, the other one will not. That'll cause them to, to, to tear apart Part to stretch um, and to separate. So that's, that's another good way to think about why these two things are separating from each other in instances of trauma or in instances of quick movements. Now let's work our way back to the etiologies and talk about some of the things that are risk factors for placental abruption. First, there are general patient risk factors, and we'll talk through these one by one. These are three that cause vascular changes. So smoking and alcohol, of course, cause vascular changes throughout your entire body. And if mom is doing these during pregnancy, it could be very damaging to the placenta and the vessels of the uterus and the placenta <clears throat> as well. Smoking specifically causes vasoconstriction and cocaine use also causes vasoconstriction. So that's the vascular change there. Alcohol is detrimental to vessels in general, and hypertension also causes vasoconstriction as well. So all of those contribute to uh, placental abruption that way. Having a prior placental abruption or having a history of placental abruption is a risk factor because you had some problem the first time, and that puts you at risk for having that same problem um, or maybe additional associated problems a second time. One study found that there's recurrence of placental abruption in about 4 to 12 percent of cases. The next group of risk factors are specific to the individual pregnancy, whereas these might describe the mom or the, the person, the the, the bearer of the baby, these are more individual to the specific pregnancy and they might vary from one pregnancy to the next. First, you have preeclampsia. This is a condition that also has vascular changes that can also change how the uterus is connected to the placenta. You also have polyhydramnios. This is a condition of having too much amniotic fluid during the pregnancy. You can imagine that if there's too much amniotic fluid, if there's too much fluid inside the uterus, it's going to be stretching the uterus. So that makes kind of that, that connection between the uterus and the placenta more tight if there's more pressure inside the uterus. Multiple gestations, such as having twins or triplets, that also does the same thing. It also stretches the uterus. Having more pressure in there puts more pressure on the uterus. Having sudden uterine decompression. So there's a number of ways that this can happen. Most commonly, it's with a rupture of membranes. It's when a woman breaks her water. The uterus is under pretty high pressures from having babies, possibly with uh, multiple gestations, two or three babies, or possibly with high, uh, polyhydramnios, high, um, high amniotic fluid. And when all of a sudden you lose all of that pressure, that's quite a big shift. That's quite a big like pressure differential. And that can, can kind of stretch the uterus and the placenta and tear them apart. In fact, you're more predisposed to placental abruption 
due to uterine decompression if you do have multiple gestations. So these two risk factors are very related to each other. They're both independent risk factors, but they're also even worse when you have them together. So I've, I've indicated that with this arrow here. Lastly, having a short umbilical cord can also lead to more stretching of the uterus by kind of pulling the placenta. If you have a short umbilical cord and baby's doing flips inside the uterus, um, baby's going to be pulling on that placenta a little bit more and might kind of destabilize that very sensitive connection um, where the uterus is elastic and the placenta is less elastic. Lastly, the third category is traumas. And as I mentioned here, traumas really make a big difference because you're moving two structures that have different consistencies. One of them is willing to bend, the other one is not. These are potential types of trauma that can cause placental abruption in pregnant women, car accidents and motor vehicle accidents in general, a fall, um, especially a fall onto the abdomen can be very dangerous, and violence, including intimate partner violence. All of these can cause abdominal trauma that can stretch the uterus, and of course when you're stretching the uterus, you're also stretching the placenta, and the placenta is less willing to stretch. So that's the etiology and how it leads into the pathophysiology. <clears throat> now let's discuss the manifestations. You can break up placental abruption into four categories, and we'll talk about each of these. The first is called class zero. It's considered asymptomatic placental abruption. And this one is the most minor, of course. This, in this, you don't have many symptoms. Um, you, you, don't, you don't have any symptoms at all, actually. And you only notice a blood clot on the maternal side of the placenta once the placenta's been delivered. So this is a diagnosis that's made retrospectively. You don't know <clears throat> that there's a placental abruption until after baby is born, until after <clears throat> the placenta comes off naturally after delivery. So um, in class zero, you don't have any symptoms. It's safe. It's a retrospective diagnosis. Class one is considered mild. In class one, you have up to a small amount of bleeding and you might have slight uterine tenderness. Now I've put this less than or equal to here because it's possible with all of these gradations of placental abruption to have no vaginal bleeding. But in class one mild, you could have up to a small amount of vaginal bleeding, a small amount of vaginal bleeding that comes from the uterus. There are also some pertinent negatives in the mild class. Mom has normal vital signs. She doesn't have hypotension. She does not have tachycardia. And baby does not have any fetal distress. So baby's heart rate has been pretty consistent. There's no uh, decelerations or anything concerning on baby's end. Baby's still moving as normal. Class one is considered moderate, and this is when it starts to get serious. You can have up to a moderate amount of bleeding. Again, you don't have to have bleeding, but you can have up to a moderate amount. You have significant uterine tenderness now, and you'll also have tetanic contractions. We'll talk more about those in just a second. In class two, moderate placental abruption, you start to have abnormal maternal vital signs. So you can have tachycardia, high heart rate for the mother, and or orthostatic changes in blood pressure. For instance, mom's blood pressure might drop quite drastically when she stands up. She might be hypotensive upon rising. Baby will also start to show some distress. So baby can have decelerations or diminished or even absent fetal movements. So we're starting to get concerned in this case. And uh, we, we, we do wanna take at least class two and class three very, very seriously. Of course, class one is also very serious, but we're a little more uh, reassured with that one. You also have abnormal lab values in class two moderate placental abruption. You'll notice hypofibrin, fibrinogenemia, so low fibrinogen in the blood in class two. Class three is considered severe placental abruption, and this is where you start to have serious complications. You can have up to a heavy amount of bleeding, but again, I want to reemphasize that you can have all these other problems. You can have fetal demise, you can have mom in hypovolemic shock, even without evident vaginal bleeding. So you cannot use the vaginal bleeding alone as an indicator of the severity of the placental abruption. But in any case, in class three, it could range from no vaginal bleeding to very heavy vaginal bleeding. The tetanic uterus here is in full force. The exam, you'll feel a very board-like consistency on your palpation of the uterus. The pathophysiology here is quite interesting and might be worth knowing. What's going on is that the blood is dissecting through the myometrial wall, and this causes a characteristic woody or rigid uterus. You're essentially bleeding into the uterus, and it's it's feeling very firm. It's feeling, feeling very board-like on your exam. We started to see that um, tetanic contractions and the tenderness in class two, but it's much, much more severe in class three. In addition, mom can have complete maternal shock, so hypotension and tachycardia, and you can have more significant lab value abnormalities. So you can still have that same hypofibrid 
fibrinogenemia, as well as co coagulopathies here. It's possible that this can even lead to a DIC-like picture on your lab values. So you can have disseminated intravascular coagulation. The reason this happens is because you have blood loss and massive coagulation. The placenta itself is very rich in tissue thromboplastin, and that's released um, throughout the body in very severe cases of placental abruption. Lastly, and um, unfortunately, you can also have fetal death in this very um, severe case of placental abruption. So this has been a short video on placental abruption. I hope it was helpful, and thank you for listening.